Do you want to share your screen? Yeah, let me, let me see how can I. Oops, I have to stop sharing, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yep. Oh, great. So yeah, so this was my, it's pretty simple. It was a pretty simple project in looking at the, you know, ridge crest, you know, earthquakes uh, deformation, you know, from uh, Sentinel INSER. But before I start, I'd like to, you know, thank, uh, you know, Catherine, Eric and the whole, you know, GMT, GMT SER team. It was a great, you know, experience, you know, being in this workshop. So, let me see. So what did I learn from this workshop? I think, you know, um, you know, it, it was a completely new territory for me. So I learned, you know, quite a bit about, you know, INSAR science and then the data repositories. And it always, you know, confused me before where to look for data, you know, what to download. There are many options, you know, and I always get confused with those. So. So that's uh, that was a great you know learning experience for me, and of course the GMTs are processing. Although I only tried two pass processing, and would like to try batch processing, you know, in future. <clears throat> so well, after learning that, I thought that how should I test myself? So I selected this example from a uh, risk you know rich crest earthquake, and there was a paper by Eric. And uh, Eric had some figures, figures in his paper. So I thought that how about if I, you know, try to reproduce, you know, some of the figures from that paper so that I know that whether I'm doing it right or wrong. So that's when I decided to go through this whole process, you know, downloading the data from um, ESA website, you know, you know, downloading correct uh, orbit files and then uh, making the config file and then run it. I think that's what we all, you know, we, we need. So, well, yeah, after that, that's my uh, interferogram that I produced, which is on the right and on the left, that's from Eric's paper. And probably, I mean, I'm happy about it, it but you guys can tell <laughs> how well I did it. <clears throat> so this is showing the uh, phase, you know, from two, you know, retrieve from two different things. So again, the left is from Eric and from the right, it's my processing. And the second figure I generated is the LOS displacement. And it was a little bit confusing for me in the beginning because I was looking at the unwrapped phase and I realized that one has to you know, convert that unwrapped phase into LOS displacement by this, you know, simple map that I listed uh, on the top. And again, uh, the left one is from Eric's paper and the right one is what I produced. Although looking at the color scale, it looks like that my displacement is a little bit larger than what um, was reported in Schuettel paper. And we are discussing about it and I think, uh, you know, in the Slack channel are also discussing it with uh, Catherine. You know, she suggested that it's probably because of some of the pixels, you know, along the rupture line, those have higher values. So maybe, you know, masking out those points uh, would be a good idea, you know, in the future. And well, uh, that's, that's it for a quick presentation. So there are a few issues that I, I, you know, found those are pretty interesting. I think I share it with the group is, you know, I want to, you know, download the frames from ESA and I realize, you know, so it's when one wants to download the frames from ESA in the beginning, it says offline. So there is no need to worry about, you know, once you download it, you know, in your cart, you know, it becomes online after a few few hours. And, you know, other option is to go to ASA website. And also when I was trying the, 
uh, first example, which is the Sentinel Tops One Los Angeles. You know, it was stuck at the phase filtering stage. So at that time, I, you know, I, you know, seek help from Catherine and Eric, and and then uh, you know they recompiled my GMT start directory and suddenly it started working. So that was a good thing to share and. Finally, also, I found that uh, when you have a big body of water, it's probably not a good idea to use, you know, uh, uh, near, you know, near interf feature. So, you know, if it takes long time, set it to zero. All right, that's 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 you know that's what you know it was for me for <laughs> this workshop. It was, you know, it was very helpful for me. Thank you so much, everyone. Any questions? Great, thanks. That's interesting. A quick, quick question on the uh, wrapped phase. Can you go back to the wrapped phase? Uh, yes. Yeah, it looks like there are a few differences, subtle differences. Any? It looks like one. Looks like yours is filtered more than the other one. I think. Oh no, sorry, Zhu. It all is filtered more than yours. I think. If you look, say, like in the right lower right hand corner. Right. So I, um, I see. Yeah. Uh, was did you apply a phase filter on yours? Do you know or? I did. Know? Yeah, I remember I did. I have to look okay. at that, what value I tried, maybe, or is there any option in the config file that says I can look it up? But I did apply the yeah, phase, you know, filter. So this is the filtered phase that I plotted. Or or maybe yeah. Anyway, his looks a little bit more filtered than yours, I think. But that's my only thought. I see. Well, I will revise it in future. It's a learning experience for me. So the filtering is more just a matter of what you want to see. You know, it's just yeah. Um, uh, and then the uh, the next one, the unwrap phase. Actually, I think those colors match. It's just that the color bars were different. So it goes. Zhu goes from minus eight hundred to eight hundred. Yours is minus a thousand to a thousand. So if you forced it to be minus eight hundred to eight hundred, I think uh, it would. Probably be pretty close. I, don't know. I think yeah, it looks like there's some overlap of unwrapped phase across the fault on on his that may be related to the filtering as well. Look, there's know. this defo max parameter that you can yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that I, I think I set it to 65 initially okay. I was as zero. But no, very nice job. Sorry, I, I'm just nitpicking here. No, that's really completely nice. fine. <laughs> that's completely fine. I mean, your eyes can see more things than I can see at least at this point. <laughs> and what do you plan to do next? Do you have any other uh, things you want to work with? Or yeah, I think I, I mean this is a simple example, but I think I would like to look at you know some of the areas where there are more visitations, which would be more challenging, I guess. Especially, yeah. I plan to look at some deformation along in Dobarma. You know, full belt where I applied GPS technique before. Okay. Nice. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. That was great. All right. Uh, so yeah. the next person I have on the list is Luel and Beatrice. And I saw Beatrice online. I don't know who's presenting. Is that you, is that you, Beatrice? Uh, these are two different presentations. So I'm not oh, sure. Okay. If here. Yeah. You can go first if, and I'll look for it. I, I don't know. I, it's, oh, here he is. OK. Why don't you go first, Beatrice, and then we'll do the well. Sure. OK. So can you see my screen? Yep. OK, and let's, let me try to get my video on so that at least you know who's speaking or <laughs> something. Okay, so um, I am in the bad. Let me just try to get to the PowerPoint presentation because for some reason it doesn't move. Do you see anything? Yeah. Let me stop the share and let me try this again because I don't know, the presentation got stuck somehow. All right. Um, 
I think it's alive. <laughs> okay, now we're good. So uh, what I was trying to look at was the interseismic deformation in Guatemala and interseismic deformation is always tricky, right? Because uh, it can be very little deformation in a very long time. And so sometimes it's hard to have uh, the resolution to, to be able to, to see this. And so let me give you some background information about what's going on here. Uh, I spent about a year and a half, maybe more, having a fight with INSAR, uh, dealing with ALOS images, and then also with Sentinel-1 images, trying to get this interseismic deformation. And uh, we tried the NSBAS uh, processing chain, but for the region where I'm at, uh, we have issues with uh, vegetation and humidity and stuff. So the unwrapping was always painful. And whatever we got, we never were able to, to get enough uh, good pixels near the coast, for example. Um, Things were very decorrelated, and I don't know, after doing sometimes serious analysis, you got these blobs in, in the velocity fields that had nothing to do with, with what we were looking at. And when we were trying to plot some profiles, I swear to you, I could see like this velocity gradient I was after, but there was so much noise around that I couldn't really say like, I presented this somewhere. I knew I was going to be eaten alive because of the noise. Like, how do, can you tell this is this is real? And so, um, eventually, uh, we went to the people who are doing uh, distributed scatterers in Germany to see if they were able to get something. And so, this is what you're looking at in the in the picture in the right. So, they still had trouble getting all of this area near the coast. I mean, they, they are not getting it either. They're trying still, but they are not getting it uh, either. And uh, the region has been studied with GPS. So there is a block model, uh, which is based on GPS that I used to do a forward model of what the line of sight velocity would look like um, if that model were true. And uh, this model is what you see uh, on the left, and it's tailored for the results with the DS. So it's it's pixel to pixel, uh, let's say, uh, to, to see what we were expecting and what we're actually seeing with the, with the DS. So um, what you have here is a region where you have the North America plate up here, and this is the Caribbean plate that it's more like a, a wedge that's supposed to continue all the way to up here to some triple junction. But at this point, we know that this triple, triple junction means not exactly that. And we also know that we have a four arc sliver uh, over here that might be moving uh, independently. And so there's a subduction zone somewhere in here. You can see it, it's outside the, the map. And so there's a lot going on and we were, want to be able to see what's happening. So we have these two um, left lateral folds that constitute a system that's the boundary between the North America and the Caribbean plate. And so you can see that the model predicts some very interesting uh, velocity gradients. That's what we want to be able to see. So I don't want to have to go to the Germans to get my image, my, my time series every time. So I want to find a way to process uh, INSAR in order to be able to study this, uh, not only by myself, but also with students in Guatemala. So that's that's the whole idea. So I got uh, 19 images and I got 20 interferograms. I only used frames that were more or less in the center. I didn't go for the ones that had um, the, the southern part uh, near the coast because I knew that was gonna be hard. And this was like a first approach just to see if I could get something. And so this is the interferogram network. So I guess it's fine to cover a certain amount of years, but you'll see what happens with the atmospheric corrections because the network doesn't have those triangles that, that help you uh, get uh, some signal out because you have these three images that close uh, uh, a time together. So I did the time series analysis with, uh, with these 20 interferograms. And so this is what I get. Um, 
up here, I have uh, the original results. Let's say no atmospheric corrections, no nothing. And so we see things, but not exactly what the model shows. Um, this is, okay, I, this, this is supposed to be the model, but there's a weird thing here. So let me just take a look at the model. It doesn't, it, it doesn't need to have this yellow thing over here. It's like this. And so um, we don't see exactly what we want. So I try to do atmospheric corrections. And since I'm not sure how exactly is, uh, GMTSR is handling those, I ended up using five iterations. Maybe I can use more, maybe I can use less. I'm, I'm not sure how to, how to assess how many interactions I, I need to, to do. But I get this. And I was like, OK, maybe, but it looks kind of reversed with the sign with respect to what I wanted to see in, in, from, the, from the model. But I did the subtraction of the atmospheric corrections from the original, and I'm getting this thing that you see down here. And it's what GMT SAR is thinking is the atmosphere, the one that looks like my model. So maybe because of the way my network, my interferogram network was made, uh, GMT SAR is making, it, it's thinking that my actual signal is the atmosphere is calculating it uh, that way. But here is the comparison to the model. Um, uh, forget about the yellow stuff. This should be green and blue. And um, this is what we had with the TS. So um, I also wanted to take a look at the Guatemala City Graben. Um, that's uh, around here. This is the, the thing that you, you see uh, here. Because we know, first of all, it's it's uh, it's a city, so you have buildings and stuff that make it easier for, for the insert to work. And also because I'm pretty sure there's some subsidence going on there, not only the, the large scale deformation, but I'm pretty sure there's subsidence because of, of, um, uh, of extraction of water. So uh, this is the original one. This is the corrected for the atmosphere, which I'm not sure it's okay or not. And this is the difference, but in any case, uh, Either here or here, we see some, some spots of very clear uh, subsidence. So this makes it a very interesting thing to study uh, on a closer look uh, on, on the formation. And just to give you an idea of, of how this looks like in the whole, uh, with the tectonics of it, um, this is how it looks at, in, in Google Earth. So this is the, uh, the graben, and you see all the faulting that, that goes around, and this will be the subsiding uh, areas that are not crossed by any faults, but are kind of in the middle of, of, of them. Um, these are more structures that, that have been uh, located over there. And this is the original case. Uh, this is the one with the atmosphere correction, allegedly. And um, this is uh, the same one with, with, the, with more deformation. And so that's what I got. And so if anyone has any suggestions, they're welcome. So my to-do list is, uh, I will improve the network first, so maybe I get a better atmospheric uh, correction, and that's running right now. I'm running the, I'm getting the inter, the, the um, I am unwrapping the inter programs from this network. Um, we know that the ionosphere is a problem at those latitudes, so maybe try some ionospheric corrections as well, and then once we get the hang of it, maybe uh, increase the time interval because I only use three years, and we have many more. So we can actually, I think, do a, a great study here once we figure out what's the best way to process all this stuff. And so thank you. Great, thanks. Are there any, any questions or comments? I don't, Eric's not in, in, the background, in the background slide, you should have DS, velocity. It was that based on Alice one or uh, Alice data or is also? Oh, sorry. The, the, the thing I did here was Sentinel. Because... Yeah, the, the first is the background, the, the, the background, the DS one. Oh, yeah, it was it was uh, Sentinel too. Oh, oh yeah, it's also Sentinel. Okay. Yeah, everything is, is Sentinel. Uh, eventually, we will get back to Alice, but Alice has more problems with the ionosphere. So we first need to figure out how to deal with that to go back to Alice. Okay, so the, the other quick comment is that I think the that's a kind of a type of the uh, the color bar should be I think it should be millimeter the unit, but you put meters for many of the. Oh figures. yeah, 
it's I, yeah. I had I had this uh, slide hidden and I had put new figures, but somehow I got back to the old figures, the ones that are uh, on the lower panels. So the, the, actually, the, the other question I was asked, yeah, the, uh, the your work is about to, to see the uh, the atmosphere delay. Did you try any other correction other than the GMT star butching method? No, no. I we have tried them uh, on our earlier work, but I didn't try any of that here. All I did was to go for the automatic stuff that you had for the for the tank series, and all I did was tell it to to do five iterations. But I, I didn't touch anything else. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot to tweak there, uh, but I need to to kind of read that information carefully to figure out uh, what to do. But I didn't. I just did five iterations on whatever it is that uh, the batch uh, processing is is doing. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think so that one thing increase the network okay. will help the atmospheric correction because it kind of relies on how many connections you have uh, with a specific date. Um, so by increasing the number uh, of connections on each side, it'll, it's supposed to uh, be better for the common scene stacking. So give you a better estimate on the atmospheric noise. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I'm hoping. So that's why I'm running the whole new network uh, now so that I can try to see if it works. Or not. One thing to do that's really simple before doing this SPAS or any of these things is in GMT SAR, there's a thing called stack. Dot csh and stack.csh you just give it a list of the names of all the interferograms and it will just add them all up and and divide by the time and um, and that's a good way to get if you're if you know if you think this is just a uniform rate then there's no really need to do a time series because that's going to accommodate changes in rate so it's a good start and then the other thing is that I know it's painful, but if you look at every interferogram, you might find ones that are just really bad and shouldn't be included. And you know, I know there's hundreds of them, but um, sometimes you get ones that have huge atmospheric error. And, yeah. In fact, when I was working with ALOS and with Sentinel-1 before, like when we were doing like all the, the work, uh, we had many, many interferograms, and we were able to to find a few images that, whenever that image was was part of, of an interferogram, you got something weird. And so we decided, okay, every interferogram that contains this image goes away, and right. we were doing some some cleaning up uh, that way. But yeah, it's it's a lot of work just looking at the uh, at the interferograms, trying to see whatever you can pick up with your own eyes and then see what the processing can do for you. Yeah, this is a tough area because the phase unwrapping will be hard and the atmosphere is hard and, the, and there's and the deformation rates are pretty low. So yeah, but I think just more data like Jawa suggested, you know, and more connections. Yeah. But you could try the stack too. It's really easy. Yeah, and, uh, thank you. And yeah, I yeah. guess You'll, you'll hear about this at some point whenever we get it right. <laughs> so. Good, great. Yeah, send us your results. Yeah, thank you. I'll stop sharing, let me find where. Okay, and Luel, do you wanna show something? Yes, I will be uh, sharing my screen now. Okay. Let me turn my camera. That looks good. All right. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Lula Michelle. I am fairly new to uh, uh, you know in SAR processing, so it's been a great learning experience for me. Uh, and I've been talking, you know, to Eric as to what I can do to make this test run, and to kind of learn more about the processing and. Uh, the SAR images and inside processing overall. And so we decided to look at the uh, alpha depression and the volcanoes that we have there. So it's just like a, a test run really, but uh, this is 
trying to capture any surface deformation near the Bajo volcanic area. All right, my, okay. So the first thing that I wanted to do was learn more about the Sentinel uh, 1A, uh, you know, um, images, you know, satellite images. And, uh, you know, as most of you know, it's launched, it launched in 2014. And it's C band with 5.3 gigahertz and 5.5 centimeter. And it has different acquisition modes and acquisition modes. And the one that I used is the IW. And of course, it has uh, different polarizations as well. And the one uh, that I used is uh, BV. And so the images, it's, uh, it's basically three images that uh, I took, you know, limited by processing capacity, time, and uh, learning curve. And so uh, I took three images from a descending, uh, you know, uh, satellite, and uh, in the, basically the resolution of that would be five by twenty uh, meters, you know, and it has about three sub swathes. So that's what I, I I processed all of them, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, you know, it consists of nine bursts and the uh, inside processing algorithm that uh, uh, is inbuilt in GMT Insar does the debursting for us as well. So that's good. And so what I have here is basically the Ethiopian rift here. I'm very much interested in the East African rift system in general. And then you have the rift, 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 triple junction, and uh, you have the, uh, the AFAR depression in here. And most of the rifting events here are magmatotectonic. So uh, some of them are driven by magmatism. So you have a lot of volcanoes in this uh, region. And with the volcanoes and rifting activities, you also have a lot of earthquakes too. And so whenever there are diking events and any kind of uh, deformation related to rifting, of course, you'll capture that, uh, uh, you know, slip movement. And uh, so you have the focal mechanism solution. And I was actually very surprised, uh, you know, I, I did the JMT course as well, and uh, I was able to make this map and very surprised to see uh, that it goes this deep. And it's probably beneath the Moho interface here. And so this is really the motivation. And this paper was sent to me by Eric. And uh, this is Albino and Bix 2021. And they've been able to capture over 76 or 81, if I'm not mistaken, volcanoes along the East African Rift system, both within Ethiopia and the Kenya Rift. And they've been able to image deflation and inflation activities. Uh, and even pre and post eruption uh, uh, events as well. And so the one good thing about the, the study area that I looked at uh, within the Alpha Depression, basically you have a very small cloud coverage. It's desert throughout the year. You know, it's, I mean, uh, you don't have a lot of cloud coverage in general, you know, that's the, if you look at the average high and low temperature, it's basically, you know, 100 degree Fahrenheit and low will be uh, uh, mostly above 80. Uh, and so it's a pretty hot area, it's desert. So um, it's good uh, to process, uh, uh, you know, the, to do some insert there. So you have F1, F2, and F3, and this is the images that I downloaded. Like I said, three images. And this, uh, this are the phase, uh, you know, the, the for each different, you know, sub -spots that I got. So the F1, F2, uh, and F3, so the in interferogram. And so what I learned while doing this is, uh, and this is from John Wessels, and of course from the GMT in our course here, is that each pixel carries a spectral characteristics and should be represented by real and imaginary number. And so that can be explained by uh, this exponential, complex exponential function. When you convolve that, and that's what interferogram means. So you have the constructive and destructive um, um, addition uh, in our subtraction accordingly, and that's like convolution. And so you have the coherence estimation that comes with the interferogram as well. And uh, you have two different images and then you have their pixels and that's uh, the conjugate complex of that. And more or less the correlation here is good when it comes to this uh, area, when you get out of the rift depression itself, I think it probably will have something to show here. This becomes a mountainous area, but here they are pretty good. 
And so this is the amplitude as well. So more or less uh, probably uh, fresh lava floor or something like that. Just, you know, smooth areas, but other could be rugged. Uh, and uh, I'm not here to really <laughs> interpret the, the images, uh, but it, this is the amplitude uh, histogram, uh, equalized histogram images as well. Uh, and uh, other than here, for example, it seems here more or less good as well to interpret the, the images. And so just to show that this is the coherence image of the merged subswazes that I found. Um, and this is the phase unwrapping. Uh, to, to say one thing here, maybe, is that when, as you do the interprogram, as if I understand it correctly, it, uh, altogether the algorithm does debursting and topographic phase removal as well. And just to mention one thing before I move on, that my topography, my DEM completely covers the top part, uh, but uh, it doesn't cover an area down here, just the tip, you know, corner, but I just wanted to mention that. And this is the phase unwrapping. And I also learned, and Eric also was explaining that to me yesterday. Uh, but more or less, you know, everything will be represented in phase, and which would be expressed by uh, a sine function here. And whose wavelengths in this case will be 0 0.5 centimeter. And you have to convert this to a summable linear units. Uh, and you, you do that by uh, multiplying applying it uh, and divided lambda over four, four pi, if I'm not mistaken. And so this is the unwrapped displacement map of volcano in the Bajo locality. And this is represented in red. Uh, more interested in the uh, uh, velocity here, velocity map. And uh, as you can see, you have some positive signals in some of the volcanoes that you see here. And this clearly actually uh, demarcates here that this is a mountainous area. And the depression kind of begins here. So I, I'm not really terribly concerned about this area, but this, and of course, I don't have a lot of data to make any robust interpretation as well, uh, but this seems to be uh, good as compared to this one. And so this is the uh, uh, paper uh, by uh, Albino and Biggs. Uh, and, and so this is the Dabahu locality. So this is the Dabahu locality, and they were able to show uh, that there is a steady increase in uh, uplift uh, in, in velocity. They are represented in centimeter per year. And so this is the region for me as well. And, and it's the same thing that there is a steady increase more or less. I don't have the time series, but at least uh, for this one, I can say that uh, it is kind of increasing. It's a positive signal. And so the same thing is uh, true here or for some of them, I, we have the positive uh, signals here, which is the positive uh, millimeter per year uh, signal. And really special thanks to uh, UNAFCO, all the organizers, and Eric, he really uh, carried my, you know, you know, held my hand, <laughs> I would say, and went through, uh, you know, every process and explaining things. And I'm really happy. And uh, uh, looking forward, to what I wanted to do is, uh, of course, you know, studying the volcanoes and how they inflate and deflate uh, is is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, but at the same time, within the Alpha Depression, you have uh, a lot of rifting happening. And there are so many, as can be seen from the focal mechanism solutions, so many uh, block rotations and things like that. You have strike slip components. So moving forward, what I want to do is compile a lot of uh, uh, data and, and you know zero in on some of these uh, small, uh, grabbins and, and detect any um, block ro rotation within the, the alpha depression. I mean, I'm, I'm going to read more paper, you know, more papers about this. And uh, if that is feasible, I'll go for it. That's, uh, that's really my plan. And so thank you so much. That's all I can say. And if you can, if you have any questions, you can ask me, uh, find out the answers. <laughs> I'll be happy <laughs> to entertain them. Great. Thanks. That was Really interesting. Looks like you're have a pretty good start there, and Thank it's you. a great area because it's there's not much vegetation, so you can get almost perfect coherence. Uh, so yeah. 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 Any questions? I. How many image? How many repeats did you look at? How many SAR images? You said you had three. Or? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Good start, and you know if you look at that Biggs and paper, they had I don't know. Looks like they had about 50 or 100. 
Oh yes, oh yes, yeah. <laughs> it was it was faulty. It was all. You're, gonna, yes. you're yeah. gonna need a big disk drive to store all that stuff. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, that's good. And then I noticed also on their paper, there's some GPS sites in the area that might be really helpful. Okay. You. Okay. I think it was on their last slide. Um, let me see. Right there. Are those? Are those triangles, the red triangles, are those GPS sites or are those city? Oh. Uh, the, those are, I think, the volcano location more. Oh, or less. volcanoes, OK. Yeah. Yes. Maybe yeah. there's not much GPS, but it's always helpful to pin down the atmospheric errors with GPS if you've got, if you've got it, so. Um, yeah. OK, I'll look into that. I'll look into that. I mean, a lot of people. A lot of scientists are interested in that area, so they've been deploying different equipment. So maybe yeah. more likely there would be some GPS studies as well. I think UNAVCO archives a lot of this data, so you might check the UNAVCO archive. And see okay. If they have the GPS. Uh, yeah. Okay. Nice. All right. Thank you. Any more questions? I don't see anything in the chat right now, but. Uh, All right. And I'll stop sharing. <laughs> okay. So the next, um, Rob has a couple of presentations. There was what he calls the Kathmandu team. And I think they're doing it um, by, by a video. And then Prabhat uh, is also here, I think. So yeah, let's see. Uh, Prabhat, can you go? Are you available? See here. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we can sort of, it's a little bit, um, right again. Hello? The, the audio is a little messed up. Uh, okay. Shall I start the, uh... In five years, I'll see. Lost him or is changing his. Uh, yeah, shall I start the presentation on? then? Okay, let's do the presentation yeah. then get back to Prabhat. How about that? Okay. Oops. Okay. Oops. Ah. Hello everyone, I'm Kuzanyo Pani and I'm number visit. Is that working? Yeah, it's working for and me. Being the whole idea uh, to join this course was to use GMTSAR as a tool to process the lens of students' data using INSAR. And uh, we have, I think, started from this very fundamental step of using GMT to create maps and then uh, process the demand side data using GMT SCR. I'd like to share my presentation with you. Um, yes, so we created some maps using GMT commands. This is the map of the world, the map of the family we have highlighted. Um, the national boundary. We have created the map using the brown color fleet and uh, yes, and we generated some other relief map and contour map, but they are not that much of a good resolution. Then we used the LOS image of Paja, California for the processing and to create the interferograms. If we Look at this in detail. Have this correlation image. We see that um, even though this is the settlement area, there is a very low coherence, and yeah, in the middle of it there is high coherence. But yeah, overall, in this whole settlement area, there is very low coherence. 
it might be due to the deformations or I don't know, might be because of other situations during the measurement. Um, this is our phase. We see very good fringes over here, and there are some very narrow fringes over here, I think, which is a mass type using the mass filtering process. This is the image where the noises are masked out. And finally, we got this unwrapped maze. Uh, we did this using snuffle and um, .css command with a threshold of zero. I don't know why the threshold of 0 0.5 was not working in this file. And finally, we got um, our line of sight displacement image. You see over here, you see that it's in the range of 10 mm, and around the border, we have somehow low displacement, whereas around the border, we have very high displacement. If we look at um, los.cpt file, um, We can see that there is a range of minus 52 to minus 66, um, which is our displacement values. And yes, we we could do the up to this much the processing up to this stage. And we aim to do further processing using some of the sentinel data for the land subsidence from different event. So that's all. And thank you, Jetina Putin. Thank you to all the instructors for this and learning that platform. Bye -bye. So yeah, and their interest is in looking at landslides in the Himalaya. They were having some issues with downloading data from ESA. Um, I'm not completely sure why, but I told them I would work with them to try to get that uh, fixed. So. Maybe that's the same problem. I didn't realize the data went offline. And so you have to wait a um, certain number of hours. Maybe, I don't know, but. Um, yeah, I, I showed them the Alaska site as well. Um, so let's see, um, Prabhat, are you on again? The audio is still a little messed up. So I can start PowerPoint. Yeah, Pramod, I think that, that your audio, maybe if you can find a different kind of microphone, like, you know, headphones that have microphone or something. Maybe it's the laptop uh, microphone. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interference, it sounds like. I could step through the presentation maybe and he could put uh, notes on chat, I don't know. We could do that or we could come back if, if okay. he finds a, another computer or something and then you could push the slides and he could okay. talk to them. Maybe that's it. Yeah, it's so. back again. Maybe it's the internet connection. Is my voice still clear? 
still still not a good connection. Um, sorry, we can't hear you. Do you want to try to come back in about one or half an hour and see if maybe you could find another computer to use? Yeah, I'm trying to chat. Um, okay. Yeah, why don't we move on to the next one and then we'll see. Okay. So um, I guess Catherine Materna had um, someone, Olivia Paschal. Is Olivia here? I am here. Can everyone hear okay. me okay? Yeah. Okay, Perfect. I'll share my screen. Okay. So just for some background, I'm Olivia. Um, I'm starting graduate school in the fall, working with Rowena Lohman. Um, so I haven't nailed down a project yet. So I took this course to kind of get an intro into INSAR processing and data. And, um, but I'm not positive whether I'll be using GMT SAR or ICE more. So what I did was just kind of um, get familiar with the processing and um, how to use the program um, and then practice my GMT skills a little too um, because I took that course right before this one. So I chose um, Greece as the example to use and then I kind of based my new data kind of off of that example and I chose an earthquake, a big earthquake so that I could see the data really well. Um, I didn't, you know, I wanted success on my first try so I chose a big earthquake. Um, so I chose one in 2016 um, in Japan on April 15th. And this is kind of my overall results. Um, the wrapped interferogram on the left with the focal mechanism of the big earthquake. And the and this is sentinel data um, on ascending, on an ascending track. Um, and then my unwrapped over on the right, and this is just one of the swaths. Um, but it shows pretty good displacement, I think. Um, and so now I zoom in to just the, um, the wrapped interferogram. And so obviously um, right here, we can see the, oh, didn't mean to show the volcano yet, but right here we can see the big earthquake um, towards the center, it becomes decorrelated because, because of the magnitude. Um, and then there are some other features I can see um, in kind of other areas on the island. There's one, oh, well, this is the volcano Mount Aso, um, which I think is also causing some um, fringe displacement there, uh, which is kind of interesting. So that's a big topographic feature. And then up here we can see kind of northeast. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but up here there are some some rings here and then this kind of bulges and this bulges here. So I looked for additional earthquakes because this one um, had foreshocks and aftershocks. And so I plotted the earthquakes on the day of, which was April 15th, 2016. Um, and that kind of explains these fringes up to the northeast of the main earthquake. Um, and then for additional explanation, I added in some more earthquakes and you can see kind of the dark red is the aftershocks, the dark blue is foreshocks. Um, and this is, I just added one day before and one day after to my kind of search range for focal mechanisms. Um, so that kind of explains a few of these, these shapes in the fringes. Um, but then I was kind of looking for this one here and I added a few extra days. So this aftershock came three days after um, the main event, which is interesting to me. I didn't know that could happen three days later. And then I did the whole um, period of time between the passes of Sentinel and a few more showed up, but those were kind of offshore. And then looking at the unwrapped data, um, in that first plot, I had only plotted the one swath because I ran into this merging issue. So I played around with the swath merging and um, that ended up working. I still have some issues with this plot, just the, um, the color scale wanted to do it, not in um, RGB. 
but I was able to at least get the, the merging to work. And then, so that was my first example. And then I wanted to look at a glacier. Um, and so I did, and I had less success with that. Um, I looked at the Jakobshavn glacier in West Greenland, and I just did a, a two pass in June. I kind of got the most recent um, data I could. I, I ran into the problem, I was trying to do it in July, but the orbit data comes out a few weeks later. So I got the most recent one I could. Um, this, this third swath is all, is completely noise. Um, but the, unfortunately the glacier I was looking at, or at least the tongue of the glacier is also completely noise. It's just as decorrelated as the water. Um, and this is kind of zoomed in to the feature I was looking for. And this is what it looks like in Google Earth, just for reference, there is actually, <laughs> A glacier there just looks like water on the interferogram and so I wanted to ask the instructors kind of is this potentially a DEM issue I had to use aster data um, and that I think is 2009 and this is a, turns out it's a really fast moving glacier so if it has changed enough between 2009 and June 8th then we might just have an issue where the DEM isn't um, functioning properly with our processing um, but there could be other issues as well. I'm not exactly sure. So I wanted to kind of see what y'all thought about that. And that's, that's pretty much all I've done so far. So I was thinking we Great. could discuss it. That's a lot of progress actually. I mean, my thoughts on this glacier are, is this floating ice or is this ice that's flowing along the glacier bed of rock, do you know? I think um, up up here to the east, it should be okay. um, grounded. Yeah. Grounded, yes. But I think a lot of this tongue is is floating. So one problem with ice, it's not a problem, but it moves more than say um, a few centimeters in that twelve day period, and that can cause it to decorrelate completely. So okay. what what ESA wants to do is they want to launch a third satellite and have it following one day instead of six days, because one day might, then you might get good correlation. So I think everything was just moving too fast and, uh, okay. you know, you lose correlation. Um, and that, and so NASA wants to do the NISAR mission because it's L-band, longer wavelength. And since there'll be fewer fringes, you can get better correlation over these ice streams. Uh, okay. Yeah, so. Do you think the DEM is an issue though, that it's too uh, old? I don't, or I don't think so, because if let's say the baseline was really small, and it probably is small, if it was zero baseline, the DEM doesn't matter at all. So if it's 50 meters, you might get uh, like one half of a fringe for every 100 meters of elevation change. So it would have to have an error okay. of like hundreds of meters, and I don't think it's that far off. And okay. you can sort of tell yeah. from the surrounding area. So I was I also just. The ice Maybe. moves a lot. Sorry. Yeah. I was thinking another time of year might have been better too. I thought I was trying to get um, good movement for when it is melting and moving, but I think maybe that was too much. So I should try kind of another season and see if it, because yeah. likely it moves slower. It might be better in the winter. I mean, the other thing that can happen is if the surface of the ice is frozen one day and melted the other day, you get complete, complete decorrelation. So like in the center, middle of the winter when everything's completely rock frozen, you might get a better decorrelation. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's what Rob oh. says, maybe melting, uh, yeah. Yeah, if you get water in the snow, it changes the dielectric constant quite a bit, I think. So it's, mm -hmm. sometimes it works better when the snow is really dry and cold, I think. But, yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. That's great. The, Earth, the GMT is fabulous. I mean, Paul gave you guys a good course there to put in the little base map, and uh, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed that. Okay, that's a good skill. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. And if you use ice, that's just fine. You should learn both of them. I think. 
Yeah, I wanted to. Are you taking the ice class? Yeah. It's coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will. good. Great. So the next, Jawa, do you want to? You want to? You have to leave. Do you want to do Rodrigo first? Because you have to go to the airport, or um, is Rodrigo going to be here? You know. Yeah, yeah. I think he's here. Okay. Just arrived. Just arriving. You can go first, and then we'll go back to um, two people in my group about that. Hi. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm late. I, I thought it was, I, was, I got it an hour. Yeah, different time. So I'm going to share my screen. Is that OK? Looks good. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. So, um, presentation. Uh, yeah, my name is Rodrigo Gomez Fell. I'm um, I'm originally from from South America, from Chile, but I'm doing um, a PhD in the uh, University of Canterbury in uh, New Zealand, Christchurch, yeah, and looking at uh, ice ocean interaction in Antarctica. So I'm gonna start first with uh, well first. Thank Chaiwa for all your your help. It was amazing what you did with the course and how to you guide us through GMT, GMT SAR to so we can do this beautiful uh, interferograms. Uh, I have some installation issues at the beginning. I have a, a laptop and a desktop. In the desktop, I couldn't install it, so it seemed that I have different versions of GMT on my PC. Um, I install it from uh, from different sources at different times. So I think about a year ago, I tried to learn GMT and so probably install it for, through the through Conda or the APT manager. Anyway, I did it again um, during the course and didn't work then from source. So I got a bit of a mess on that on that uh, computer. So I, I uninstalled it, removed all that I, I could, but it still have some uh, some some issues. Uh, so I, I managed at the end to uninstall everything and reinstall uh, GMT and then from source and then GMT SAR. But I have, a, an, I have an old GMT version five in my kind of base environment that was still bothered a little bit so I couldn't process directly. So what I do at the end is just uh, deactivate my base environment, my Conda base environment, and then GMT SAR will, will run smoothly in my in my computer. I, those are both the desktop and the laptop are Linux Mint. Um, uh, yeah. So what, what I did, I did the, after that, I did two pass interferometry based on the, uh, on, on the example that is on, on S1A SLS tops LA and using that config file. So this is Kaikura 2016 earthquake um on the left and then on the right is a is the unwrapped face i i think it worked pretty well other thing interesting here is two scenes are merged so i use two different scenes from the same pass so i merge those to to get into the program to hold the whole area because it's um it cuts, cuts at the middle with sentinel one yeah uh down here is a small link for a for a cool uh, article about this uh, this earthquake and they use ALOS and Sentinel One. I do a three D deformation of the area as well. It's, it's in science. You probably know about it. Uh, and this is a uh, more close to what I do in in Antarctica. So this is a uh, I work with ice tanks. I, I don't know if you can see the the mouse. Can I do the maybe the last laser point? So this this is. Antarctica down here. This is a Western Ross Sea. And where my mouse is on the right, this is land. Um, both sides here. Yeah, the one on the right is the interferogram. And you can see these uh, uh, things sticking up from the coast. Those are ice tanks. You can see right here, pretty correlated most of the area. This is middle of winter. This is June. But you still can see that the ice tanks, this, uh, these buildings are floating. This is land ice. So it's coming from the interior, it's floating on top of, a, of the ocean. So it's land ice origin. They're pretty decent. They have a lot of fringes. 
uh, and and here you can see this on top of the ocean. You can see this I got fringes as well. So this is uh, land fast sea ice. So this is sea ice has been frozen during the winter, and also it's, it's stuck and uh, to land. So it's it's compacted, it's uh, stabilized because it's frozen solid um, towards the land. I don't know if you can understand. Yeah. So I unwrapped that one and I was pretty surprised I could unwrap also the, the fast land area as well. I was pretty interested. I have, I, I have done the interferometry before with using gamma for in some area of the coast. This is pretty much what I'm doing for my PhD, but I've, uh, I haven't done it. You know, I haven't unwrapped it yet. So I was pretty happy with that. This is very, very hard to interpret. So what's happening over here, this a lot of deformation to do ocean swell and other things, but I'm more interested in, in the stability of the of the faster that you can actually see with the interferogram that is stable and is solid and is and is actually connected with this uh, other features that are called ice tanks over here. And you can see even that some fringes come from one to the other. So there's some mechanical connection between them. Yeah, and that's uh, all I have. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thanks. So in this image, I, it looks like in the where your mouse is almost, there's a, yeah. a piece of ice that looks like there's a fracture or something along. Yeah, there's this continuity over the fastest as well. So you can get things that are moving in different ways, you could say. So they are because the patches of ice that get frozen. And once go frozen in, in like in a smooth patch, or they could break off and then frozen like, or refroze again. So it's a very pretty dynamic and complex environment. And it's quite interesting, but yeah, you need you need to have ice on the ground as well to to try to is the, interpret. Is the black the line the grounding line? The black line? No, that's the uh, it's the coastline. So the grounding coastline. line will be yeah yeah. This our ice tanks. So grounding line, for example, here where my mouse is, will be yeah. down back here probably. So that grounding line is you know you know the difference yeah with coastline yeah. and grounding line yeah. And. And the ice that's floating, of course, will go up and down with the tide. And so yeah, yeah. there'll be fringes at the grounding line. Uh, maybe <clears> there's I, too I, many fringes. Yeah. I, I agree. And on the grounding line, probably down here. But yeah. on, on the other side, I'm, I'm assuming that this hydrostatic equilibrium. So it should be going up and down and smoothly with the tide over here. So it shouldn't be a bigger difference with the, I think, with the with the <clears throat> observation from the satellite because we should be same angle towards the sensor i think have you tried the double difference where you yeah two yeah. interferograms from three images and then you can cancel out the yeah yeah i have done it with velocity. the yeah i have done it with, with gamma and and you can get a less less fringes of course <clears throat> i think there's an example of that in the download site of the double difference i i wouldn't i'm not I, sure I, yeah, I want yeah. to ask if you could do it with uh, with Gamma Star as well and how, how you do it. Yeah, you can do it with EMTs. You just put them together as a stack. So you align all the images, the three images to one master and then um, and then make two interferograms and just difference the two interferograms. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And uh, <laughs> it, it works great. Uh, yeah, nice. Oh, excellent, cool. But Thank I think you. in six days, ice moves pretty far, so. Um, well, th this is 12 days, two, five, 12, 12 days. 12 days. Oh, wow, yeah. that's even worse, yeah. 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 Nice, wow, good. Oh, here it is, somebody put in, uh, now I'll put in the double difference example, yeah. Cool. So you could try that and then. Yeah, uh, also up here is a link to an article of doing the same thing, but in the Arctic, where they actually classify different types of uh, land fast sea ice using the programs. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'll stop any, sharing now. Any more questions? All right, thanks. So we have two more presentation. Shagun is, um, I saw him this morning and I think he's online and we were just sort of debugging some things. So I'm not sure um, he has a complete story, but uh, you could show us what, what you were working on. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so, yes, I can share my screen.
Okay. So I hope you see the screen. And yeah. good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm going to talk about land subsidence in India. My name is Shagun. I work at GFZ Potsdam in Germany, and I'm joining University of Cambridge next this October. And yeah, so starting from land subsidence. Land subsidence is a huge problem worldwide. Capital cities of many countries are subsiding at a significant amount. For example, Tehran in Iran is subsiding by more than 25 centimeters per year. And so, it, so is the case with Beijing, Mexico, and other cities. According to US Geological Survey, more than 80% of the ground uh, of the subsidence is caused due to over extraction of groundwater. Now, India is a country where we extract groundwater for every purpose. It's the largest user of groundwater and it pumps very much. So in last year, GMT SAR workshop in 2020, I've and my, also my in my master's thesis, I worked on land estimating land subsidence in Delhi region. Uh, Delhi is the capital city of India, and the neighboring comprising neighboring states make it national capital region of India. So it includes Delhi, Gurgaon, and Faridabad. Uh, Delhi has a huge population density, and there is a major difference between groundwater uh, between water demand and water supply, and due to this. Many people have unauthorized bore wells, and the at some places the groundwater depth is as deep as 80 meters. So yeah, yeah. So this is the results that I have generated in last workshop, and you can see the red and blue colors. So red signifies deformation and blue uh, uplift. So you can see two prominent features, one here and one in southeast. And yes, so let's stop this here if yes. So, and one more small deformation. I also compared the results from SBAS and PSNSAR. So SBAS, for SBAS I used GMT SAR and for PSNSAR I used SNAP plus uh, stamps. And these are the images that I have used for SBAS. I have used 17 images and for PSNs are 33 images, but the number of interferograms generated were around like similar. So 32 for PSNs are and 38 for SBAS. <clears throat> and the time period was 2019 to 2020. And this was the comparison of SBAS and uh, PSNs are results, which was not, yeah, which was not similar exactly, but almost similar. So, and yeah, this subsidence was happening very near to airport and mostly in the urban areas. Yeah. And yeah, so then I was wondering what might be the reason of this uh, subsidence or groundwater is the, is, is groundwater the major reason for this subsidence? And then, uh, yeah, so you see two images here. The background is groundwater. The blue color represents shallow groundwater levels and the red color represents deep groundwater levels. The first plot is the groundwater depth in 2014, and the second one is groundwater depth in 2017. And these uh, circles are the areas where, uh, where we found major subsidence. So we lay over the subsidence region on the groundwater map. And so you can see it matches exactly. Now, this was about Delhi. I was wondering, because Delhi is not, only the, not the only city which is uh, under severe groundwater stress you can see some of the some uh, red pixels in south as well so i had i searched on google what are the some what are some south indian cities which are under a groundwater stress and then i saw the word chennai most of the times and therefore i started to i wanted to work uh, see the similar results in chennai i don't hope to see them but yeah let's see so yeah, so Chennai is in southern part of the country. It's a coast, coastal city, and uh, it's beautiful. And for Chennai, I used almost 21 Sentinel-1 images, ranging from 2000, January 2019 to March 2020. And this is the network. So each dot here represents the Sentinel-1 acquisition, and each line represents the interferogram. So, uh, I didn't have mentioned the number, but there are in total 17 interferograms that I have generated. 
70 interferograms, 70 folders, and a million of files, but these are the important ones. So this is from one uh, interferogram. This is the wrapped phase, filtered phase, unfiltered, or oh, sorry, unwrapped, amplitude and coherence. But we cannot say, well, we cannot conclude uh, just by using one interferogram. So I, the, yeah, again, this is just one interferogram, the unwrapped phase of one interferogram. But I also generated the mean uh, un unwrapped phase, mm -hmm. uh, adding all these unwrapped values and just dividing by the number of interferograms. But I see these gray lines and I don't know the, the source of this, but we tried the similar thing with coherence. So this is one 50 day coherence and then I generated mean coherence, but with coherence, it's working nice. You, you can see some high coherence region. Red color represents high coherence values, there, whereas blue represents low coherent values. And this is ocean, as you can see. And yeah, so I wanted to, work, I wanted to see what, it's causing these unwrapped problem. And since I'm just one step away from running as bus, I, I'm, I will run as bus after this workshop. And then, yeah, uh, for this has been, so this uh, work has been done just by using images from 2019 to 2020, but I checked and we have Sentinel-1 acquisitions from 2014, so I, will probably work on the whole area, uh, the whole time period. And then I also wanted to compare the PSN as bus, which I will do in future. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Are there any questions or? Uh... <clears throat> it says, here's one. Do you plan to combine GPS data with your INSAR results? From Cindy. Oh no, we don't have GPS data here in this area. There's none. Okay. No. Yeah. Huh. yeah, I don't know what the problem is with the lines. Yeah, I. I Sometimes. No, I, wait, I just I I checked with fewer images. Yeah. So I checked with 50 images. So there are in total 70 images. I was oh, that... randomly checking with 50 images and I I don't know which image has problem, but yeah, this is the 50, uh, the, the mean of 50 images. Yeah. And this is not coherent, sorry, this is phase. So I see some of these uh, smaller blue color pixels, which I think are subsidence. But yeah, further I investigation is required. I suspect there's like one or two, one bad, but yeah, somebody says NANs, yeah, that's the, that's it. There's one of those images has NANs in it, and when yeah, you add it yeah, to exactly the others, exactly. it just makes a mess. But um, yeah, you're close. Yeah, That's good. <laughs> yeah, and and no one's has studied these areas. I guess. I mean, there's no, no. It's a huge country, and there's a lot of groundwater issues. So wow, interesting. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Any more questions or? Okay, we have one more, uh, Mohammed, um, and I saw Mohammed's here, and he's been looking at heritage sites in Egypt, and it's a really interesting project. I think he's just getting started on it. So, uh... uh, I face some problem in internet connection. Oh yeah, we're going to go back to Prabat too. Yeah, if you if you're oh, um, please, uh, if there's a con yeah. If you want, I could show your slides. If your slides don't work, I have them. So. Uh. Hello. Um, it may take a minute. Here we go. Yep, looks good. Hmm. So we aren't hearing you anymore. We may have lost your sound. You have a beautiful picture, but no sound. So, All right, 
right, so I think we lost Mohammed. That's been happening when we have our meetings. He cuts in and out. The internet's not, the connection's not great. So Mohammed, I think I have your slides. If you just want to go and do it and, and narrate your slides, I could show them. I think it's the same slides. I got them yesterday. Yeah. David, I think we lost him completely. We lost him? Okay. Yeah. Let's let's go to um, back to Prabat and see if we can get him online, and then we'll go back to Mohammed. Hello, everyone. That, Is my that's a little voice better? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, can I go share my screen? No? Sure okay, 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 thank you. I'll share the screen just so one second. Mm. Uh, is no, it no. <laughs> start from first slide? <clears throat> How about I share slides? There's a lot of noise going on there. Okay, okay, okay. You can share. Yeah. I will stop. Yeah, I will stop. Noisy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Better than um, Start now? Uh, Rob was sharing the screen and now. Yeah, I, I can start sharing, but I was sort of hoping you could turn. There's a lot of background noise, so if you could turn your ears off. Rob was going to share your slides okay. and talk over them because. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's better. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, there is problem with uh, the internet connection. So Prabhat, as you can see on the front slide, he's a uh, PhD student in India, and he's looking at um, crustal deformation in Himalayas with GPS and topography, and so he's looking at INSAR. And uh, hopefully you can put questions on, on the chat, which I can't see at the moment. Um, and so he made five interferograms. This is set using Sentinel data. Um, and he wanted to see if he can do INSAR time series analysis to compare with the collect with the GPS data that he's collecting. Um, and so he'd like to cross verify the GPS data with the INSAR time series. So he made, um, uh, here's an example interferogram, looks pretty good. And I believe he applied an ionospheric correction to the one at upper right, if I understood correctly. Um, Do you want to go then, to full screen, Rob? Um, okay, sorry. Uh, maybe it'll be, then we can see better. Okay, ah, sorry. That's perfect, yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the one, at upper right, I believe he applied an ionospheric correction. And uh, the, the one on the left is ionospheric correction only on the lower one. Uh, and then at the bottom part is a map of the GPS sites, um, the various locations, and then just a map of the equipment and the setup at each, each site. Um, and then here's another interferogram, um, and these again, these are all sentinel data. So it looks like he's getting pretty good coherence. Um, and um, another one, 
yeah, so he's done a series of interferograms. <clears throat> and then this is the, uh, the phase of it. So again, um, and then suggestions or advice towards how you could do insert time series analysis for these interferograms. So um, I'm not, I can't see anything on the chat, but questions or comments? Uh, in the chat, Prabhat said that he's installed these GPS sites during his PhD thesis. Um, yeah, that's great. And then, yeah, the ionosphere correction, I, I was kind of, I guess I was kind of curious. Um, is that what you expect to see with the ionosphere correction included, the differences between them, or they look pretty different to me. I'm, I'm not sure it's better or not. So I, this I is done know. using the GPS data, maybe? I mean, the GPS, provide, since it has two frequencies, you can yeah. somehow extract the ionosphere correction um, and then make a grid of that, or, or you could do a global TEC model. But the yeah, global so models aren't, aren't that good usually. So yeah, so I'm not sure how the ionosphere correction was done. Nice. I don't know if Kang is still here. He's been doing ionosphere corrections in mountainous areas, but it's pretty important to get big signals. So I thought it was an interesting study um, and probably challenging. And I think that the last slide said about what to do next. I think trying to get lots of data and and stacking or doing time series to cancel out the atmosphere and the ionosphere and uh, and then the GPS can be used to constrain each interferogram. Um, Jawa and Catherine Guns have they they put a module in GMT. Sorry, I don't remember the name of it, but you can give it the two times of the SAR images and and give it the GPS data at those two times and it will it'll make a large scale correction for the displacement. It doesn't do an ionosphere thing. It's just sort of forcing the interferogram to match what the GPS is seeing. Um, so that's that's probably the way to go with your sites. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the name. Maybe I think has it's the name correct, of it. correct in SAR with GNSS. It definitely has the word correct right up front though. Okay, we could put it in the in the chat somehow. Oh yeah. It's in the new one. The, you have to download the, the latest version to get some of these things. Oh. Uh, uh, there it is. I want to ask if we are working in Himalayan regions or the areas where it has high topographies, is there anything we should really care about like comparing low topography areas versus high topography area in terms of inside processing? Yeah, well, when we had the lecture, I forgot, I think it was Eric Lindsay did the lecture on atmosphere and there's two types of atmosphere corrections. There's one layered atmosphere. So if let's say from zero to 500 meters elevation, there's a big thick layer of water vapor on the first acquisition and then the second acquisition, it goes away. Well, when you'd make your interferogram, it's going to look just like the mountains. And so correcting that, you can do a elevation dependent correction. It's doing these things in mountainous areas is really difficult. Mm -hmm. And then if, if you expect to see an uplift that's related to the topography, say to, due to thrust faulting or something, you shouldn't be removing that atmosphere elevation dependent atmosphere because it might remove your signal. So I think the GPS is the way to go. I think that having that large scale constraints um, from the GPS. Yes, and my suggestion to Prabhat would be, I don't know if I'm correct, but uh, to install corner reflectors at, at the points where he has already uh, GPS stations and then to track the coherence, uh, these corner reflector time series and compare it with GPS. Yeah, that'd be good. Then you know the phase more precisely from the INSAR. And yeah, thank so you. Mohammed sent a, oh, he's back online. Um, 
I have his slides here. Mohammed, I don't know if you want to try again. Uh, I could show yes. your slides. Do you want me to bring your slides up and you can talk about them? Try that. Yeah, I will try to share my screen. Okay, try to share your screen. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, the, 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 there is a presentation about the formation of culture hurt sites in Egypt. Culture hurt sites, uh, which, uh, which means the old building and places or some of citadels, which uh, create the culture and the Thirties of uh, so there is uh, my 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 PhD project is guided uh, by uh, Fort. So citadel. This is the north east of Egypt. It's a big city called Alexandria. This is a photo of uh, Google Earth for this. Uh, Citadel and there is a real photo for the citadel. It's located in and some of previous study uh, um, uh, oh. It's another inter internet outage. So Mohammed has a really interesting study here to look at these heritage sites. And um, he made a lot of progress. That, uh, oh, he's please? back. Okay. Yeah, now okay. you're back. You were gone for about a minute or two. We're looking at the um, Citadel slide. Uh oh, gone again. <laughs> Why don't I start to share the, the slides and then maybe um, can people see the slide here? I think. So we're on this slide and Mohammed is, I don't see him here, but um, he did process a lot of interferometry data from Sentinel and this was going from 2015, 2021 and he made lots and lots of interferograms and um, he has some results and I, you know, I'd like to work more on this because I think it could be tuned a little better, but um, yeah, he's back now. Mohammed's back. Um, Mohammed, I was showing your slide on the interferogram network, all the, the images that you put together. And um, yeah, 300 interferograms, 196 scenes, that's a lot of data. This, um, And then this was the correlation and um, in general, I think it's pretty good over on, let's see, I think this is sort of upside down. This is in radar coordinates. So if we went back to your area here, the correlation is going to be good in this desert area. And then the citadel is connected to it. So maybe um, you can see that over here. There's good correlation. So one could unwrap the phase and, and maybe not so much in this area here. Um, and then here's some example interferograms and um, before and after filtering. I don't know what, this one looks a little strange, but it's after the filtering, the Goldstein filter, it cleaned up some of the issues. Um, and then here's the unwrapped phase, which is 
that's nice for one interferogram, but you need like hundreds to make to be able to look at subsidence in this area. But um, I was recommending to Muhammad that he processed this with 200 meter wavelength filter and eight by two downsampling. But for such a small area, you could do this SLC cut and then process it with a 60 meter filter and one downsampling and really zoom in on the uh, on these small scale features. And I think that's what they want to do. Um, and then he was able to generate a velocity field with that larger scale filter. And I wasn't quite sure what the uh, scale bar is on here, but blue probably means it's going down. Um, although when you do these analyses, you need to have a big stable area somewhere that so the velocity is relative to that stable area. But um, And Jawa gave him some code where you can, after you do the SBAS, you can go to a particular pixel and extract the time series at that pixel. And that's built into GMT SAR. So if you're interested, send an email. I mean, that's one of the problems with GMT SAR. It's hard to find the script that you that you want to use. The documentation could be improved. In other words, we could have a list of the names of the different scripts and what they do. So you could go in there and find the right one. Uh, and uh, that's the velocity field. This is the displacement. Um, and, and again, it would be really interesting to zoom in on on some of these individual buildings and things to see what you can see. Uh, and thank you. So, I, so, so Mohammed, I hope I did justice to your slides. And um, I don't know if there's any questions. You can look in the chat. Again, I think you're getting really close to some interesting results. So, um, yeah. Are you back online? You want to say a couple Hi. things or? Yeah, go ahead. Uh oh. Hello? You're back now. Oh, yeah. Just for a second. I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, I can't hear you. But I... We can hear you right now and then you cut it, you go in and out. Um, but. Melissa suggested you could type your questions or whatever into the chat. Uh, I think you you decide. Oh, coming and going. <laughs> okay. Well, Mohammed, we should keep sending email and. and connecting on this, because I think you're getting really close to a, a good time series. Um, so I'd be happy to coach you on that. Um, and I think that's it, unless someone else has something they want to show. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging in there for an hour and a half, but it was a lot of interesting results. Um, and really, if you want to continue your research on this, send us your questions, and we can have Zoom meetings and you know try to uh, get some good results out of the INSAR time series. So, okay, so I think we're done, everyone. Unless I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay. Yes. I uh, can I uh, give you a suggestion, Masha? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it possible uh, for the I don't know for the next workshop, probably next year, to do a full um, process for insar process uh, from beginning from downloading the data from uh, whatever you want to do in uh, just give, give me a, give the um, whole the um, attend the full example for processing 
because yeah. uh, still I have some problem with that. I know it's yeah the we should do that. Sometimes you have to wait a long time, so you'd have to have pre pre download all the data. But um, yeah, there's all these different steps of downloading and finding the orbits and and then doing a two pass example and then trying to do time series and the time series take so long they could take days that it's hard to you have to have everything already set up maybe but i think we could do that yeah actually this workshop was really uh, helpful to me because uh, i didn't know actually i can say i just know very very short about um basics of I'm, I'm saying theoretical basics of the INSAR, but nothing about processing. But uh, still, I think I have many problems with not exactly about downloading the data, but in the process, yes, I have a few problems. So uh, I think giving actually um, giving some basics in the um, how to process the data it would be really helpful with giving an example in the workshop. Uh, like what you did in uh, GMT, which I think it was really helpful. If you do that like that for GMT SAR, it would be very helpful for present for attending. Yeah, I really appreciate it for that. Yeah, we should have one that goes from start to finish. And um, and the thing, I think the best way to learn it is to go through the download examples and each one and look at how those were put together. Um, Actually, the example, I could um, I could run the examples for Nicaragua, but when I downloaded my data and uh, just try to process, but it's not working, that's yeah. fine saying that uh, because the example works, but my my old data, <laughs> no, it doesn't work. <laughs> and I, I couldn't that find happened. what's the problem. <laughs> yeah. It happens to me also. It's usually the orbits. That's yeah. my biggest problem. Getting the right orbits is always the hardest part. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, please send comments about the course, and I think there's going to be a, um, a questionnaire that comes out to everyone. So, uh, and and send questions about your processing. Thanks, Dave, for running it. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, all the instructors for hanging in there and helping everyone. Uh, yeah. And sorry about the Zoom issues today, but I think we got through it. Okay, we'll see everyone. Hope Goodbye. Good to see you in person. Bye.